The technology derived from the economic competition of the Cold War is really quite amazing. From occupied stations a hundred miles north of the Arctic Circle to placing a human on the moon, the era really did drive the boundaries of technology and humanity. But not every experiment was a success, and sometimes those victims of the war that was not a war are too easily forgotten. The 28 men who died in the collapse of Texas Tower 4 on January 15, 1961, deserve to be remembered. After 1953, the air defense strategy of the United States was driven by a military policy of the Eisenhower administration called the New Look. This attempt to balance Cold War military commitments with the nation's financial resources changed the focus of air defense from attempting to protect the nation from attack to providing enough warning to preserve our nuclear attack capability, counting on the doctrine of massive retaliation to deter any attack. This was grounded in the reality of the nuclear age. The former strategy of planning to intercept bombers became essentially futile, as even if we could effectively destroy 99% of an incoming attack, the power of hydrogen bombs meant that an attack would still be devastating. The goal, then, was to provide our strategic air command with enough warning to allow us to preserve our strategic bombers for a retaliatory strike. There was, therefore, a focus on creating a comprehensive early warning strategy, with significant focus on filling gaps in radar coverage that might be exploited in an incoming attack on the United States. Over the course of the 1950s, the U.S. and Canada jointly worked on a series of land-based installations that would eventually create a multi-layered system of the Pine Tree Line, the Mid-Canada Line, and the Distant Early Warning Line. The development of these systems required massive effort, and each is an engineering marvel in itself. But the lines still included numerous gaps that were expected to be filled via a number of different systems. One of the most extraordinary of those ideas was proposed in a report by MIT's Lincoln Laboratory in 1952. The report considered the possibility of extending radar coverage by building platforms in the Atlantic using offshore drilling technology. They concluded that a set of such platforms equipped with radars could extend coverage several hundred miles offshore, giving half an hour additional warning of a bombing attack. In January of 1954, funding for five towers was approved with the goal of providing an interlocking early warning perimeter stretching from Nova Scotia to New Jersey. Because the platforms would resemble the offshore oil platforms that could be seen in the Gulf of Mexico, they were called Texas Towers. This was quite an engineering challenge. These towers would be substantially larger and placed in substantially deeper water than any oil platform that was operating in that day, and they would be placed in the storm-swept North Atlantic. Originally five towers were planned, but only three were completed. Towers 2, 3, and 4. The towers had to be sizable to fit the radar equipment. The platform was a triangle approximately 200 feet per side and included more than 6,000 tons of steel. And they would be anchored deep. Tower 4 was set in approximately 185 feet of water. Deep sea oil platforms go much deeper than that today. But in 1954, most oil platforms operated in 20 to 40 feet of water. They worked a difficult balance, trying to present minimum resistance to waves, yet able to withstand hurricane-force storms. Because of their size and the rough seas where they were to be located, they could not be constructed on site. Instead, they were jack-up rigs. Their watertight floating hulls were built in shipyards and towed to their location, where the legs were lowered and the platform raised to its regular height of 83 feet above mean load tide using hydraulic jacks. This created the historical novelty of being the first Air Force stations to be christened and launched from a shipyard. Towers 2 and 3 were built at the Four River Shipyard in Quincy, Massachusetts. They raised a slight difficulty as the platform had to fit through the gap on the raised Four River Bridge, where clearance was less than two and a half feet on either side of the platform. Once constructed, each tower included a large search radar and two large height finder radars, each enclosed in a neoprene radome to protect them from the weather and three antenna for communications. The first completed was Texas Tower 2, about 100 miles east of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, in December of 1955. Tower 3, 50 miles southeast of Nantucket, Massachusetts, became operational in November of 1956. The final tower, Tower 4, placed 65 miles southwest of Long Island, New York, became operational in 1958. Of course, the Russians were highly interested in the towers. It was not uncommon to see periscopes from Russian submarines. Russian trawlers, purportedly merchant vessels but probably spy vessels, spent so much time circling the towers that one of the airmen said that at night there were so many lights you thought you were at Coney Island. Rumors spread that the Russians were sneaking onto the platforms at night. The towers were essentially self-contained floating bases. 
Texas towers contain bunk rooms, recreational facilities, a library, and a dining hall. But life of the 60 to 100 crews stationed aboard the platforms was not easy. It would have been easy enough in isolated and cramped quarters to get what they call tower fever. The work could be difficult. Supply could only be transferred when the currents cooperated, meaning that airmen would be manhandling heavy deck cargo in the middle of the night, something sailors would usually avoid. But the stations were also seemingly always rocked with noise, not just from station operations, but from the sound transferred up the legs that were anchored to the ocean bottom. They mounted the world's loudest fog horns, which on a foggy day would blow every 29 seconds. In the North Atlantic, fog was common. The Tower 2 foghorn once had to be used for three weeks straight. Crews rotated in every four weeks found that when they got home, they couldn't sleep without noise. As a sign of the quality of life of the towers, Air Force personnel referred to them as the Iron Bastards. But perhaps the worst of all was the constant motion that was caused by the waves. Tower 2 was said to have a sort of jogging motion. Tower 3 was a twister. Tower 4 in the deepest water was the worst of all, bobbing and weaving so much that the crews referred to Tower 4 as Old Shaky. And that was a warning sign for troubled Tower 4. In June of 1947, as Tower 4 was being towed, two structural supports were torn off and lost in rough seas. After the tower was placed, the Air Force decided to install the radar before the supports were fixed. That affected the stability of the station. Tower 4 was in by far the deepest water, over 180 feet, more than three times the 56 feet of the water in which Tower 2 was anchored. There was no precedent at the time for anchoring a platform so deep. Then, in September of 1960, Tower 4 was battered by the 50-foot waves and 132-mile winds of Hurricane Donna, a hurricane so powerful that it killed 364 people and caused $900 million in damage. The tower sustained enough damage that it was reduced to a skeleton crew of 14 Air Force personnel and 14 contractors until repairs could be made. They tried to stabilize the tower by filling the legs with sand and concrete. The tower couldn't be abandoned for fear the Russians might capture its sensitive radar equipment. In January of 1961, a strong winter storm with wind speeds up to 80 miles per hour and waves up to 40 feet tall battered the already damaged Texas Tower 4. On January 14, 1961, U.S. Coast Guard Lieutenant Paul Yost recalled, I remember going to sleep that night with the wind just howling and telling my wife, I hope we don't get a call tonight. But he and the crew of the 125-foot active class U.S. Coast Guard Patrol Boat Agassiz did get a call an emergency call to try to rescue the 24 men aboard Texas Tower 4. The Coast Guardsmen raced through the gale on the, on the 15th, their motto, Semper Paratus, always ready. The winds were too high to attempt a rescue by helicopter. At 6 p.m., the Agassiz was still more than two hours out when the tower radioed, we are breaking up. They were still an hour away at approximately 7.30 p.m. when Tower 4 disappeared from radar. The platform had disintegrated and collapsed into the sea. All 28 of the personnel on the tower died. Only two of the bodies were recovered. It was eventually revealed that the Air Force had already decided to decommission the program before the collapse of Tower 4. The advent of nuclear missiles, which moved much faster than bombers, meant that the towers went from adding about an extra half hour of early warning to just 60 seconds. That revelation made the deaths aboard Texas Tower 4 seem all the more futile. The Air Force did add emergency escape launches to Towers 2 and 3 so the crews could get off quickly, but by 1963, those two towers were also decommissioned. Tower 3 was salvaged, but Tower 2 was unsalvageable and was demolished on site. After a review board determined that the collapse of Texas Tower 4 was due to human error, a colonel who was the acting commander of the Boston Air Defense Sector was charged with involuntary manslaughter, and two other officers were charged with dereliction of duty. The colonel was acquitted in a court-martial, and the charges against the other officers were dropped. In 2003, a study of the collapse of Texas Tower 4 did fault organizational failings, but essentially determined that we lacked the technology at the time to predict the dynamic effects of the tower's design. The study concluded that using modern technology, we could have saved Texas Tower 4. The families of the victims of the collapse of Texas Tower 4 formed the Texas Tower Association and for many years sought official recognition of their family's sacrifice from government. That recognition finally came in February of 2011 when President Obama sent a letter to the association. Donald Abbott, who was the son of Dave Abbott, a welder who died in the collapse, was quoted in the New York Times after receiving the president's letter, There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about my father.
we were pals. I'm the History Guy, and I hope you enjoyed this edition of my series of short snippets of forgotten history about 10 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button, which is there on your left. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. And if you'd like more snippets of forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.